we are here if for our inaugural event for our Always versus News program. And um, to begin the event, we have our first presentation of, of oh. in April with, uh, with Amanda Fitzpatrick, and a history instructor here at RBC April. So I hope you enjoy the program. And um, if you have questions, there are pads in the back of the room which are welcome to take and write down. Or at the end um, of the program, we can pass around the mic and we can ask and enter the questions. All right, enjoy and um, thank you for that. Well, thank you. I have a really long one, so you won't have any problems hearing me. So uh, welcome and thank you for coming. I do have to make one correction just because it's my personal thing. I'm actually a professor of political science and history, but I'm predominantly a political scientist, so i got to get that little plug in there since I've been studying it since I was 17 years of age. So uh, welcome, and I'm uh, really looking forward to talking to you tonight about the First Amendment and uh, free press. Uh, littered throughout my presentation, you're going to see some uh, some cartoons like here on the front. And I put these in intentionally, not just for your entertainment, but because part of the way in which the media expresses itself is oftentimes through these kinds of political cartoons. So uh, all of them uh, have to do with whatever it is I'm talking about at that moment. There are a couple I couldn't find the non-copyrighted version of, so they've got a big C over them, but we can still see them and enjoy them. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, first thing I want to talk about is, you know, why do we have uh, this, this conversation about freedom of the press? And one of the compelling reasons to talk about it is because it's in the Constitution. Uh, I always find it really interesting that we have a lot of debates in this country about the Second Amendment, but not so many about the First Amendment. Um, and I'm going to make the point, and I think I'm going to make it pretty well, that the First Amendment is more important to our freedom and to democracy than the Second Amendment is. And that might not make me popular, but I think it's true, so I'm going to say it. So I think it's really important we understand that the right to have the ability not just to speak, but to have information provided to us about the government and what the government is doing is in the First Amendment. And so it is something that not only the Founding Fathers thought was important, but that we should think is important and we should consider um, what it means for a free democratic society to have a free press. So I don't know if you've seen this quote here, but this is a good one. So Thomas Jefferson, of course, was the author of the um, Bill of Rights. and Thomas Jefferson says, uh, the basis of our government being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. But I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. And this, of course, was written uh, in 1787, so he said this prior to adding the free press into the First Amendment. Now, of course, if you're a student at all of Jefferson, you'll know that Jefferson's views on the press before he was president change a little bit after he becomes president. Uh, but uh, a lot of times his talk about the press is sort of taken out of context. He is critical of the press, but what he's really critical about the press is, is not so much what the press is saying, it's the way in which the news is sort of being mixed between opinion and what he saw as really press, advertising and what he saw as really press. Oh. So this is a really important uh, quote, and it really shows that the uh, foundation of a free society really starts with this notion of a free press. Um, so what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the history of what the Supreme Court has had to say about uh, the importance of a free press and what kinds of limitations or restrictions have been placed upon the press and what the court has done with that. There are a lot of cases we can look at. I've chosen several to talk about today. But we always want to start with this first case, which is really the seminal one, which is Near versus Minnesota. So we're going to be talking later about this concept of prior restraint and what that really means and how that plays out today. But Near versus Minnesota is a case predominantly about this concept of prior restraint. And so the idea in this case is whether or not a state, and in this case the state of Minnesota, can pass a law that preemptively prohibits the printing of certain uh, material. And in this case, in Near versus Minnesota, what they're talking about is uh, material that's considered to be libelous or scandalous. And so when this case makes its way up to the Supreme Court, uh, we get our first decision where the Supreme Court clearly says that the press is somehow different than, than other groups of people. So the decision says that the state law that allows prior restraint is unconstitutional. 
And the decision also extended protection of free press to the states through the 14th Amendment. And if you don't know the 14th Amendment, this is one of the Civil War Amendments. It does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is talk about extending the protections that are in the Bill of Rights to the states. When the Bill of Rights was first written, it only applied to the national government. So when we say that people have the right to freedom of speech or freedom of the press, what we're saying is that the government, meaning the national government, can't take away those rights. And it's not until the 14th Amendment is passed that we begin to see those rights extended to the states. It's a process called selective incorporation. And so what has to happen for those rights to be selectively incorporated is you have to have a Supreme Court case that deals either with the entire amendment itself or a portion of that amendment. So in the case of Deer versus Minnesota, this is our case that's selectively incorporating free press so that states also can't limit that right. So that's the first case here, Near versus Minnesota. Um, it goes back to 1931. Second case we want to look at is also a really famous case. This case is New York Times versus Sullivan. And this is a case that deals with whether or not a newspaper can publish something <coughs> Um, that, that contains false material or not. And it actually had to do with an advertisement that was submitted to the paper and run. Uh, and uh, the, the, the material in question uh, contained some false statements. So in the case of the New York Times versus Sullivan, the question is, is does everything that's put in print have to be fact-checked and absolutely accurate? Uh, and if there's anybody who's a part of the press here today, you can know uh, that's kind of a difficult thing to do because sometimes what the media is presenting is not just a list of facts, but it's presenting a perspective. And a perspective is something that might not be what you think is true, but what somebody else might think is true. And so the importance of this case is that the court held that the First Amendment protects newspapers even when they print false statements, as long as the newspapers did not act with actual malice. So if they're not trying to impugn somebody's character, they're not you know, acting in a malicious fashion, then it's okay if what they publish is not always necessarily true. It also then said that the First Amendment protected all statements about public officials unless the speaker lied with the intent <coughs> to debate. So when we're talking about public officials, they're going to make a, a clear distinction here. So if you're a, you know, working in the public domain, you're working in government, uh, pretty much almost anything short of actual defamation of character is going to be pretty fair game. And again, that's really important because if we want to talk about government, we want to have the ability to criticize government and to present a perspective which might not always be the perspective that that particular individual wants to put out there. The next case we want to look at is Garrison versus Louisiana. Uh, this case says that you have a Louisiana law that, that punished true statements uh, made with actual malice. Um, and in this case, they're actually overturned. Uh, the court ruled that unless a newspaper shows reckless disregard for the truth, it is protected under the First Amendment. So in this case in Garrison, we're actually getting an extension of the protection of the, the freedom of the press. So it's not just the standard of you know, defamation, it really allows the press to print even more uh, things that they want to print without being questioned. So it expands that protection again. In the next case, we, we actually have two cases, but they were heard uh, together. Um, Curtis Publishing Company versus Butts and AP versus Walker. Um, and this dealt with somebody who's a public figure, um, but who is not a public official. So somebody who is in the public domain, but is not necessarily an elected official. And so the question here, again, it goes back to this notion of what can be published. Can you publish things that are, you know, maybe false about that individual? And so in these two cases, what the Supreme Court decided was that a public figure who is not a public official may recover damages for a defamatory falsehood that harms his or her reputation if the newspaper's actions were an extreme departure of the standards of reporting. In the first case, in the Butts case, the Supreme Court actually decided that what they published was in fact uh, um, damaging and that the newspaper should have known ahead of time because they didn't do good fact checking. In the second case, however, uh, the newspaper actually relied upon somebody as a source for information that they believed to be credible. So when they published the information, the Supreme Court said that in that particular case, what the, what the papers had done was, was not uh, illegal or unconstitutional. 
Um, and then uh, the reason that I wanted to talk about those cases is because it then leads us into this next case, which is a pretty famous one called Hustler of E. Falwell. And this case comes out in 1988. Now, Hustler magazine is not a newspaper, but keep in mind that when the Supreme Court is protecting the right of people to publish information, they're not just protecting the right of the New York Times, they're protecting the rights of all sources of print material, and that includes uh, you know, brochures and pamphlets and, of course, in this case, Hustler magazine. And the reason that this case is important is because the Supreme Court actually reverses its previous position. So in its previous position, what it had said is, if you're not a public uh, official but you're a public figure, that you can actually recover damages. And so in this case, what happens is Hustler magazine runs a uh, what they call a satirical piece about uh, uh, the Reverend Jerry Falwell. And the piece is uh, sort of a, a mixture of an advertisement for a liquor. Um, and they're using the theme for what the, the ads had done in the past. And a sort of pseudo-interview with, with Falwell. And, and what, what ends up happening is they present Falwell as somebody who is having his first time drinking this liquor. But in the interview, they portray things about uh, sexual relations with his mother in an outhouse. So Jerry Falwell, of course, not, not liking this in particular, uh, sues. And so this case ends up in the Supreme Court in 1988. And as I said, sort of reverses what the court had done in the previous decision. So here, the First Amendment prohibits public figures from recovering damages for intentional infliction of emotional harm unless the publication contained a false statement made with actual malice. And you might say, well, that seems like pretty malicious. Uh, but the defense that Hustler Magazine put forward was, well, this is satire. Um, and satire, of course, is going to say things that might seem malicious, but if you understand that it's satire, well, then we have the right to say it. And the Supreme Court, of course, sided with them. Now, if you're a fan of any of the satirical news shows that are out today, like The, uh, the Daily Show or uh, uh, um, John, uh, why can't I remember his name? It's on HBO. I just, John Oliver's show. Uh, then I think you'll get a pretty good sense of why it is that it's important that we protect satire. Because to be quite honest, one of the things we've discovered about uh, information and where people, especially young people, get their information from is that satirical news is actually a pretty big outlet for people getting information. And so uh, as long as you understand the satire and can sort of separate the two out, uh, it's something important that we should protect. The last case then, I think it's, a, oh no, there's actually one more. Uh, the next case then is uh, another famous case. This is the New York Times versus the United States. And this, of course, deals with the famous Pentagon Papers. So this is a question about national security. Whether or not the United States government can basically say to newspapers, you have information that we deem to be classified, and thus as a result of it being classified, you can't publish it. Um, and so in this case, the Supreme Court uh, argues that um, the claim of a threat to national security is not in and of itself justification for prior restraint of publication of classified documents, uh, in this case about the Vietnam War. And, and what really comes out of this case is the important understanding that if the government is going to put in place prior restraint, meaning you say to a newspaper outlet, you can't publish certain information, that the onus to prove that real damage will be done as a result of publicizing that falls on the government and, and of course, most importantly, upon the president. So with this case, uh, you know, we get, again, the ability of the newspapers to sort of expand upon what it is that they're allowed to do. And then uh, lastly, we have this case, Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart. And here we've got a judge's order that the media not publish or broadcast statements by police in a murder trial. This was seen as unconstitutional prior restraint. So again, this deals with a case where a family was murdered. Um, the, uh, in, in order to try to prevent the tainting of the jury pool, uh, the police tried to prevent, under, under state law, the newspaper from publishing any information that they gained about the trial. And of course, this case winds up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says that the gag order violates the First Amendment rights of the press and the community. So as you can see, we sort of had this progression of cases in which the Supreme Court has generally sided with the free press it, as much as possible, arguing that the freer that the press is, the better that that is for society, and putting a few restrictions upon it. That doesn't mean, however, that there aren't any restrictions, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. 
Um, but before we do that, I want to go over this concept of the doctrine of prior restraint. So I've talked about it a couple of times, but what does it you know, really mean and, and, and to what extent can it be regulated? So the doctrine of prior restraint, of course, comes out of Near versus Minnesota. But again, it's this idea of what can the government say ahead of time? Sorry, we have somebody in the back who'd like to be let in. Thank you. Uh, what can the government prevent ahead of time uh, from being published? And in this particular case, in Near versus Minnesota, uh, the Supreme Court tried to establish some exceptions. Um, and the exceptions that were discussed in the decision were when the nation is at war. So the policy of prior restraint is, is much easier for the government to prove their burden when the nation is at war as opposed to during peacetime. Um, when you're dealing with an obscenity, um, and that will be changed later on, but that's early on. Um, and then uh, the act of sedition. So if you're actively trying to overthrow the government or work against the government in some way that would be deemed illegal or unconstitutional, then the newspaper, or excuse me, the, the uh, government has the right to prevent that from occurring ahead of time. Generally, however, the court has held that the only compelling interest for prior restraint is national security. Um, and as a result, as I said before, the president must make that case in the court. So you can't just blanket say, all of this is national security, uh, and you publishing it is a threat to national security, and thus we have the right to say you can't publish it. Because obviously we know if that were the case, what would happen is, well, lots of presidents would be saying uh, all kinds of things fall under the umbrella of national security. So the, the burden of proof really then rests upon the government. And, and that's a really important thing that distinguishes American uh, jurisprudence when it comes to the press from a lot of our, our European allies, particularly if you look at a country like Great Britain, where oftentimes when you're dealing with things like prior restraint, or you're dealing with things like defamation or obscenity, the burden of proof is not on the government or the person claiming that they've been defamed, it's actually on the person who's publishing the material. And so that's an important distinction uh, that these cases <coughs> establish. Okay. So when we talk more about modern times, the question then becomes when and how can the government use prior restraint? And again, when we look at prior restraint, a lot of the times what we're dealing with is national security issues. So when we go back, this is a, from a, a New York Times publication um, in 1991 about the first Persian Gulf War. And um, so the headline is, is from there. It says, Confrontation in the Gulf, Rules for Journalists' Necessity or Prior Restraint. So when we go back to 1991, um, this is the first time where we have a war where the government is trying to say to the media ahead of time that not everybody can just be engaged in covering the war, at least from the perspective of the location of the war. So if we go back to the Vietnam War era, this is sort of where this comes out of. So in the Vietnam War, there were no restrictions basically placed on journalists. And journalists could go into war zones, they could go over to the country, and they were pretty free to take pictures and report on almost anything that they wanted to report on. And um, as you may or may not know, part of what happens as a result of that reporting is that public opinion begins to change about the war. Um, in particular, uh, as news media begins to take pictures of body bags and coffins coming back from the Vietnam War, public opinion begins to change. Um, and so the government sort of learned its lesson uh, as a result of the Vietnam War. And so this is the first President Bush. Uh, this administration decides they want to try to limit that. And so one of the ways that they do that is by creating what, what are press, so-called press pools that are allowed to go along and have permission to shoot certain things. But then they have to, anything that they want to write or publish then has to be pre-approved by the government. And so what the, the New York Times is really asking here is, you know, is this about, you know, necessity? Is this something that's really about national security? Or is this just the government really abusing prior restraint? Now, um, strangely enough, um, given the sort of progression of the court cases, uh, this blanket prohibition on journalists traveling into war zones and taking the photos that they want um, as a result of war actually stays in place um, for 18 years. Uh, so it begins here in this particular war um, and then it continues on. So um, in 2003 we get this new, relatively new term, at least as it's applied here, which is this concept of what's called an embedded journalist. 
So if you remember this from the, the second uh, Iraq war, embedded journalists are journalists that are basically embedded with a military unit, and then they're allowed to travel with them and report on the war. But again, with the same kind of standard that we saw in 1991, which is that anything that you're going to publish that comes out of the war zone has to by the, uh, by the government to make sure that there aren't any threats to national security. So on the one hand, you know, there's this question about access, and of course being an embedded journalist means that you get a lot of access, but, not, uh, but, but being an embedded journalist also means that the government then has pretty big say over what you can and cannot publish. Um, so this stays in place until 2009 when the ban, uh, not for embedded journalists, is lifted, but the ban on the taking of uh, photographs of coffins coming back from war is actually lifted uh, by the Obama administration. And so for 18 years, you weren't allowed to see those coffins coming home. Now, I put this particular picture in here. It's the only one I have that's not a, uh, a satirist cartoon, because the argument over whether or not journalists should be able to take pictures of coffins usually sort of goes like this. On the side of the people who oppose it, they say, well, you know, the families are grieving and, you know, that you should seek their permission because they, if they want that information out there, that should be something they should have to consent to. But, but I actually hadn't seen this picture when I was thinking about this in my mind. Uh, how many of these people can we actually identify just by the pictures of the coffins? And so when I just Googled a picture of coffins coming home from war, this was the first one that came up. And it seems to me that, first off, these are completely unidentifiable. I mean, you couldn't know from looking at this picture whose body is actually inside of here. But not to mention the fact that we've got this group of soldiers over here. We've got one just sort of sitting on the edge of the coffin. So if the idea is that we're supposed to respect our fallen soldiers uh, and protect their families, I'm not really sure that that's really what's going on. So the other side of the debate then is, okay, if it's not really about respecting the privacy of families and respecting our fallen dead soldiers, what is it really about? And then that makes the other side go back to, well, the Vietnam War, right? Which is, if you don't want public opinion to change as the body count rises in a conflict and the number of people coming home in coffins goes up, then the easiest way to prevent that from happening is to prevent the pictures from getting out. So even though the Obama administration lifted the ban, it's actually not completely lifted. You still have to seek the permission of the family member if you're going to use a picture of that, co of that coffin in, in, in the, 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 the media. So um, it's, it's not a complete ban. It's not completely lifted either. So again, you can see you know, that we've got the government still trying to interfere. Um, so let's move on to this question. Why is a free press so important? And you know, there's some quotes and things we can talk about later. But I want to introduce you to a website that I use a lot in my classes, which is, a, I think, a really good website. It's a website called Freedom House. Um, and Freedom House is an international organization that one of the things they do is they, they look at the countries around the world and they put out a report every year on, on freedom. How free are given countries? Um, every country that they can get information on receives a score. And that score is based primarily on uh, three things. Um, number one is uh, freedom of the press. Number two is uh, their, uh, their governments, uh, their, their elections, free, fair, and open. And number three is uh, protection of other civil liberties and civil rights. And so what Freedom House does every year is they produce this report. And, and what I like is they produce this map of the world uh, based on freedom. So I want to take us to uh, the first of a couple of their reports I want to look at. It does take a couple of seconds for this to load. We sort of get that, like, ooh, it's going to load, and then it doesn't. Oh, faster than home. So this is the 2017 um, just general map of the world. So as you can see, countries that are in green are countries uh, that are considered free. Um, this isn't quite as vibrant as what you can see on the screen. So my husband is colorblind, and I'm, I'm somewhat sensitive to this. So countries like Australia, the United States, those are what we're considering to be green. Um, and these are what we would call uh, liberal democracies, countries in which you have free, fair, and open elections, you have a general respect for civil liberties and civil rights, and a generally free press. Countries then that are in yellow are what they call partly free, which means they're missing one of those components or one of those components is not particularly vibrant. And then, of course, countries in blue are countries that are not free at all. 
Um, and it's not a big surprise, I think, when you look at this map to see what parts of the world are considered free and what, can, what are considered uh, not free. Um, but it's a good starting point if you're sort of looking at you know, what's going on in the world. Um, from here, though, I want to take you to a second uh, link for their site. Let me go back here. Um, and forward is here. Um, that actually then begins to evaluate specifically freedom of the press. So um, what they have concluded, and I'll show you their report and their new map, is that while there is more media in the world today, so more sources of information, that in fact um, there is less free press in the world. And this has been a trend that they've seen going on for about the last 12 to 15 years. So despite this explosion of information, that the dampening of, of the freedom of the press is going on in the world. So this is a second link. I think this one might be 2016. They haven't put out their 2017 report yet. So this is their freedom of the press site. And again, we've got this color scheme here of blue, yellow, and green. And what you can see again is, in this case, what we're looking at is not how free the particular country is, but how free the press is. Now, they're not evaluating the content of that material. All they're evaluating is whether or not the press, the press is relatively free from things like prior restraint and from government censorship or from government ownership of the press, etc. And again, you know, not a lot of big surprises. But one of the things I like to do when I see these kinds of maps is I kind of like to do some comparisons because while there are a lot of countries here that are in that green zone, what you'll notice is that there's some differences. So the lower your score, the more free your press is. So you can see here that the score for the United States is 21. Can you see that? Um, yeah, it's there. It's, is it not popping up on your screen? It's right it's there. Yeah, it's, it's over small. here on this side of the screen right here. Yeah, so it's kind of small, right? So here's the score right here. So if you can't see it, trust me. It says 21. Um, and so, you know, as a country, as I said before, you know, if you compare us to Great Britain, right, here's Great Britain, Great Britain comes in at 25. So as I said, compared to a country like Great Britain, the United States has a relatively free press. But if you compare us to some of the other countries in the world, we actually don't score that well. So here is our neighbors to the north, Canada, who have a score of 18. And as we slide on over to some of our Nordic countries, like Sweden, we begin to see scores like 11 nine in Norway. So the reality is, is that even though the United States has a relatively free press and we get a nice green on this map, if we see the comparisons, it's pretty clear that we aren't necessarily as free as we might think that we are. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, so let me jump back over here for a quick second. Yeah. Um, you're saying the U.S. is 21. So the lower the number, Correct. the, the more freer free. the press. Correct, okay. and the higher the number. So if we were to look at some of those blue, if we were to look at North Korea, I would expect the number pretty close to 100, right? Okay. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and, and even the internet is under attack. Um, and there's a whole lot of debate, you know, the internet sort of, after Al Gore created it, uh, we all sort of were just not really, some people get the joke, not everybody. Um, uh, we, we really didn't have a whole, a really good sense or grasp about, you know, what we were going to allow and what we weren't going to allow. And of course the problem with the internet um, is that it, it, it spans across the globe. And so, you know, deciding what kind of information you're going to allow in as opposed to what kind of information you're going to keep out, uh, that becomes a sort of new challenge. Uh, so again, Freedom House has a report here, um, and they think, even though it says 2016, if I remember, this is really a 2015 look. Um, and they are particularly looking at communication apps. Now, here we've got a lot of gray, um, and those are countries where they don't have any data for because, well, these are pretty underdeveloped countries where you don't have as much access to that kind of information. But again, what they're looking at here is, you know, sort of how much freedom is there when it comes to these communication apps, things like Twitter and I don't know very much else, Snapchat, and you young people shout them out because you know them better than I do. But the kind of information that, that can be really important. So if we think about the Arab Spring, for example, which started in Tunisia, right? It's this um, you know, sort of silent revolution that has actually resulted in the war in Syria. 
So it starts in, in Tunisia with a street vendor who's protesting the fact that he's being denied a license to be able to have his um, street cart out. And um, in protest, he lights himself on fire. Uh, and that's a protest we don't see a lot in this country, but it is something that happens pretty frequently throughout the world. And a uh, video of his protest uh, goes out on Twitter. And as a result, the, the, the longtime authoritarian government of Tunisia is sort of, you know, quickly replaced and, and, uh, and you have this sort of silent revolution. But what happens is that it spreads. And what you might be more familiar with if you weren't familiar with the Tunisia case is the case of Egypt, right? So uh, when this starts in Tunisia, it begins to spread to other countries, including Libya. We end up with the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi. But then it spreads to Egypt, where we end up with the 30-year uh, dictator Hosni Mubarak in power. And we see large numbers of young people taking to the streets. And they are using Twitter, in pre predominantly, but also Facebook, to not only uh, show what's going on and to, to tell what their protest is, but to also announce to other people, hey, we're going to be meeting at this time, and if you want to come and you want to protest the government, here's where we're going to be. And so in Egypt, what ends up happening is that not only does Twitter sort of help people to organize, but it is also an opportunity for people to take pictures of potential abuses and to spread that throughout the world. Uh, I'm an Africanist by training, so I, I study Africa and, and their political systems uh, a lot. And I can tell you that had we had this kind of communication available to us 50 years ago, the apartheid regime in South Africa would have fallen a long time ago. Because what happens in South Africa that eventually begins to lead to public opinion change about that administration is you have a journalist, a white journalist, who sneaks out pictures of the dead body of Steve Biko, who was an activist, uh, a black consciousness activist in uh, South Africa. And the government had claimed that Steve had, uh, I think, went on a hunger strike, if I remember correctly, and died in prison. Well, when they sneak into the morgue and take pictures of his body, it's very clear he's been beaten to death. And so this journalist uh, flees the country with the photographs, and they get out in the worldwide press, and everybody sees this really ugly face of apartheid, which is not the face that was not only not being put out by the South African government, but was not the case that was being put out by the West, who wanted the South African apartheid regime in place, because for them, the, uh, the, the, uh, the um, opposing position would have been, well, it might fall to communism, right? Because this is the Cold War. But when Steve's pictures get out and the story about him gets out and all of these people that were being tortured by the apartheid state, the international community begins to change and we begin to see UN sanctions. And then, of course, eventually over the, ve the veto of uh, Reagan, the United States begins to divest um, from South Africa. So when we look at what happens in Egypt and the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak, you know, we can really see how important communications can be. And one of the things that uh, the report from from this organization points out is there's a list of countries, I think it's on this page, if not, we just have to trust me. Um, but there's a list of countries um, that they're watching. Um, let me see, I'm gonna go down a little bit here. Uh, it's not on this page. Um, but Egypt is actually one of them. So uh, the Egyptian government uh, has sort of learned its lesson, which is that if you don't want to be overthrown by a popular revolution, one of the things that you might want to do is start putting restrictions in place on access to these forms of communication. And that's exactly what's occurring in Egypt. So that is uh, more than just a little bit disconcerting, of course. Um, again, we can do comparisons, and I love to compare, right? So if we look here at the United States, you can see that the United States has a score of 18. Again, the lower the score, the better. If we look at Canada, we're at 16. We don't have quite as many countries to compare it to, but certainly better than France. So in, in this particular instance, the United States is relatively better than compared to some of the other countries in the world as far as uh, not suppressing uh, communications like Twitter and all the other apps you guys use that I don't know what the heck they're for. I'll have to figure it out eventually. Um, OK, so let's flip back over here. Uh, and let's move on to one more site. So um, if you don't trust um, this particular organization because you don't know it and you're not familiar with it, well, even the global news organizations agree it's getting worse. And so they've actually put up their own report every year, and we'll take a look at their ranking. They actually rank countries from one to, I think they have 190 countries on their list. 
And they've got a little bit of a different color scheme here, but sort of the same thing going on. And the countries that are in the lightest yellow are the countries that they rank as being the most free for press. And then, of course, as we move into the black zone is where we get the countries that are the least free. Um, and again, you can see, anybody want to guess where the United States falls number-wise? So this is, I think, 1 through 190 countries. 56, I'm here in the middle. I got a lot of pessimists in this audience. 37. You're closer, 41, right? So if we scroll on down here and we look, you can see, oops, wrong scroll box. What I'll show you is, um, uh, the, you have to trust me that the United States is 41st. Oh, I might fail. I'll just try to scream. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the United States is 41st. Uh, the, uh, one of the worst countries in the world probably shouldn't surprise you. Um, uh, whoops. Hold on, I'm in the wrong place. My husband is a geographer and he laughs at me all the time. There's North Korea. No, so it's 180. So North Korea comes in 179. And um, to give you an idea of how you have to get this low of a score, <laughs> uh, North Korea basically has no access to outside news unless it's pirated. Um, people who live in the cities, they, you know, they live in these apartments that are owned by the government. And uh, the, the government of North Korea has propaganda that's played through the radio or the television. And, and in the radio in these homes, it's played 24 hours a day. And you can turn it down, but you can't turn it off. So when I say you can turn it down, you can turn down the volume so it doesn't blare at you, but you can still hear it. And it's 24 hours a day, propaganda from the government, basically saying how wonderful Kim Jong-un is and how awful the West is and that all of the problems of the people of North Korea aren't the problem of their dear leader and dear leader's son, but they're the problem of uh, the United States. And so um, it's sometimes surprising to people. People will say, well, why do the people of North Korea tolerate this regime? It's so awful and they're so oppressed. And, and that's because they don't have a free press. And the only source of information they have about what's going on in the world for most people is coming from the government. And in this particular case, a government that doesn't want you to know what it's doing because what it's doing is really terrible. So again, um, you know, these are really important statistics. And it helps me to make my point which is, if you want to have an argument about why we should have a free press, I think one of the biggest arguments is fundamentally this. It is not true that when Hitler came to power, he rounded up everybody's guns. He rounded up some guns from Jews, but predominantly they actually spread guns to Germans. They encouraged Germans to actually own weapons. What authoritarians do when they come to power is they take away the freedom of the press. Um, and because that's really, in many cases, it's the only check on the government that exists. In our country, you know, we have the three branches, we've got the separation of federalism, we've got the public, so we hope all of those things will work. But our last bastion of defense against a bad government is the free press. So anytime we see a threat to that, we should be really concerned because I'm not saying that taking away your guns wouldn't be a problem either, but what I am saying is, is that historically what has happened in countries that are authoritarian is the first thing that they do is they grab the press. Anybody remember Hugo Chavez, right, in Venezuela? Comes to power as a populist leader, might sound familiar, uh, promises to deliver on all these plans for poor people and provide all of these services. And of course, the first thing that he does when he gets into office is he begins to shut down freedom of the press, and then he begins to change the Constitution to keep himself in power. And then, of course, he delivers on some of those promises, but not on most of them. And the only way they get rid of him is he contracts cancer and dies. Uh, but again, you can sort of see this, you know, this pattern throughout the world. So this is, uh, you know, my evidence that that is the case. All right, so let's go back to our slideshow. I love that picture. Uh, so, so how free is our press? Um, so while the United States boasts a vibrant free press, threats to that institution are everywhere. Um, and so this is a quote from a journalist who was imprisoned covering the uh, Donald Trump inauguration. So I'm going to read it to you. He says, the United States is largely a good place to be a journalist, with roughly 50,000 people practicing the mostly free the mostly free of government repression. But vitriolic statements from the Trump administration and previously the Trump campaign have put press freedom advocates on edge. Trump's chief strategist Steve Bannon called the media the opposition party in a January 25th interview with the New York Times. But paltry relations between American government and media didn't start with Trump. 
For years, Reporters Without Borders, which tracks press freedom throughout 180 countries, has noted declining press freedom in the U.S. Today, it ranks just 41st in the world, poorer than Ghana, Chile, and South Africa. That's down from three years ago when the U.S. held the still barely getting by rank of 32. In 2014, several reporters faced police actions while covering protests in Ferguson, Missouri. One of them, Ryan Devereux of The Intercept, was tear gassed and shot with a rubber bullet prior to his arrest. And this is from Evan Engel. So um, I think it's important that we note that there are a lot of people who are concerned when it comes to freedom of the press and this current administration. But if you do your research, you will see that there was actually a lot of complaints about the Obama administration. And some members of the press actually said that Obama was one of the worst presidents they'd had to deal with um, in a very long time, probably going all the way back to Richard Nixon, if you can imagine. Um, so this is not something that we can just sort of pin on Trump and say, well, you know, Trump says a lot of things that Obama might not say outright, but Obama was doing a lot of these same things. So when we're talking about Ferguson, of course, uh, we're talking about the Obama administration. So I have a link here. This is from a TED talk. It's a short one. Um, TED are these talks that they put out that are, you know, about sort of current events. I think that's the one anyway. Yeah. So this is Trevor Tim. And he's talking about this question that I'm asking, which is, how free is our freedom of press? I wanted to show that video because I think it's really chilling, you know? Uh, to think that we think we live in a country where, where the press has so many freedoms, and of course, it's, we don't want to downplay it. We're not China, right? <laughs> Nobody's suggesting that we are. But, but the fact that even an administration like the Obama administration, as they said, which ran on protecting the press, on protecting whistleblowers, you know, behind the scenes is really using uh, the, this national security exception to go after journalists and how sad it is that the only way that you can get sources of information now and be secure yourself and secure the people who are giving them to you is to try to stay one step ahead technologically of the government's ability to hack into what it is that everybody's doing. And I know that there's probably a lot of mixed feelings about what Edward Snowden did. I, I have, you know, my own mixed feelings about that too, because I do think that we need to balance the right of the public to know and the fact that this person took an oath and had a security clearance that he wouldn't, you know, release this information. But that is something that shouldn't be held over the heads of journalists, right? This is not something that people should fear going to prison for. Information is something that should be free and freely obtained. If the government wants to try to put prior restraint in place, then they need to go to court and they need to say this is the reason that we're doing it and prove it. If they want to prosecute somebody like Edward Snowden for violating the law, they have the right to do that, but they shouldn't do it by intimidating journalists. Because when you intimidate journalists, what you do is you act like an authoritarian. You put a chilling effect on the news, which then means that the sources of information that are available to you and I are much less likely to be available. So that's something we should also be concerned about. Okay, so why do we need a free press? Well, I mean, that's what we've been talking about this whole time. But there are a few points to make here. Uh, we need a free press so that the news is not just government propaganda. We need as much information as we possibly can. Now, I would love to go into the whole what's good information and what's not fake news, but other people have been assigned that topic and I'll let them cover it. But I still think, uh, fundamentally, that we are better off as a society with more information rather than less. What we need to do, though, in this new information age is educate ourselves on how we can become good consumers of the news. And that's part of the reason that we're doing this. We've got to you know, make sure that when we see information that we know who's putting it out there, why they're putting it out there, what, what is the purpose, what is the other side to that debate. I was just talking in my American government classes today about you know, this real problem of one side having the money uh, and the power to put its information out there and the opposite side not having access to the money to be able to buy free speech, right? especially in the post-Citizens United uh, era. So we have to be really careful about that. But I think one of the biggest dangers that we have right now as a society is that we've sort of gone down this path of false equivalencies. And that's something I really want to warn you about. It's really important that you understand that when the news is being 
fair, it doesn't mean that it's being balanced. Sometimes fairness is balanced, presenting both sides equally, but it's imbalanced when you present both sides of an argument as if they both have the same amount of evidence and support behind them. So let me give you an example. When we talk about climate science, for example, this is an area where we have seen uh, public opinion about climate science degrading, with more and more people beginning to believe that climate science is a hoax, that it's all being made up by these Ivy League snobs up in their high towers who just want to have something to talk and publish about, and that it's not really real. But if you look at the data, right, and the research that's been done on this, 97% of climate science experts believe that climate science is happening and that to some degree or another human beings are engaged in making it in, in, in helping that along. Now we can argue how much that's our fault as opposed to natural tendencies, but to deny that it's occurring and deny that human beings are affecting it flies in the face of 97% of scientists. And if you look at the 3% of scientists who do support it, what you'll see is that many of them are being funded by big oil. Um, and so what I would do is I would go back to, you know, uh, a, a little stick that, uh, sorry, what can I think of his name again? John Oliver. Oliver. Yeah, I just want to call him something else. I don't know why. John Oliver did where he brought out uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, and, you know, Bill's been going around sort of, uh, uh, there's a little joke in my house because I have a crush on Bill Nye, the science guy. Don't tell my husband. Uh, but it's true. Uh, so uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, has been going around, you know, sort of, you know, standing up against all of these climate deniers. But if you ever notice, it's always, here's Bill Nye, and here's a climate science denier. And we give them both equal access as if both points have a, you know, equal validity. And so what John Oliver did on one of his shows is he set up one of these debates where he started out with Bill Nye and then one of the climate science deniers. And then he said, oh, stop, this isn't fair. And he brought out two people to support the climate science denier and 96 scientists to support uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill Nye. And that's what we really need to realize, you know, it's not that bad information is floating around out there and that's what the problem is. The problem is, is that we've got to be smarter consumers of the news. And so, you know, that's really important. So we, we want more than just government propaganda, but we want more than just one source of information. Number two, a free press is important during political campaigns. It is critical that citizens are free to publish their ideas and read the ideas of others in order for self-government to succeed. We just had, so I just moved to LaSalle from Ottawa. This is my first election, local election, living in LaSalle. And um, I didn't know who to vote for. I didn't. Uh, it's, it, it, it actually, as it turns out, I didn't need to, uh, because other than the IBCC board, which I did know how I wanted to vote because I work here, uh, there were no contested elections. So it was really easy for me to just fill in those circles, right? Or not, my, my husband chose not to fill them in, but I figured if you're going to run and nobody's challenging you, I guess I'll fill in the circle. But how do you get that information, right? We talk about this in my American government class. We call those low information elections. You know, it's a lot easier for people to know how to vote when there's a party label attached. But if there's not a party label attached, where do we get information about these candidates? And the reality is, is that it's hard to come by. Now, some of our local reporters, I'm sure, do a good job of trying to interview people and send them out questionnaires. But oftentimes, when you read those interviews and those questionnaires, you get the kind of canned responses that I get when I ask people who are running for the IBCC board, so why are you running to be on the IBCC board? And I get answers like, oh, because IBCC is just a great place, and I just want to help out and do my part. Well, OK, wonderful, but, but I, I need to know a little more information than that. That's hard to come by. So you know, we really need to make sure that we've got a free press that's putting out as much information about elections so that we know who it is that we're voting for and how we want to vote. A free press allows for freedom of expression. And that's really key in, uh, in our society. We protect, I always say to my students, we protect all speech, but we really protect the speech we hate the most because it's what needs protecting, right? So uh, you know, I talk about. These, uh, you know, people who uh, belong to this um, uh, Westboro Baptist Church, right? Any familiar with these people? You know, these are not nice people. Uh, you know, this is a, a, he's now since passed, but, you know, this is a, a, not really even a church. It's just sort of a group of people, and they go around the country, and, you know, they protest at soldiers' funerals, and they hold up signs. They're not protesting in favor of the soldiers. They're, they're protesting that they're dead. They're, they're glad that they're dead because they died defending a, quote, fag country. 
And they're really, they say really awful things, and they're really horrible. And uh, I was at uh, Northern Illinois University the day the, those, the shootings happened, uh, and uh, they were going to come protest there. And there were a lot of people who said, oh, we don't want them here. And, and I didn't want them there either, but, but they have the right to speak their mind, right? And we have the right to listen to it or not to listen to it, but they have the right to speak their mind. And that's part of what freedom of expression is about. And finally, a free press holds the government accountable to the people. And that is something that we really should not overlook. We, you cannot understand, I've lived in authoritarian countries before. Um, I lived in Czechoslovakia after the fall of the Soviet Union while they were transitioning to a democracy, but it was anything but democratic when I lived there. And if you've never lived in an authoritarian country or visited one, you don't know the really chilling effect that that has on you until you walk down the streets and, and with you know soldiers standing with guns randomly checking your status and questioning and people saying don't talk to people on the phone about sensitive information because you don't know what's being listened to or having to pay a bribe that I didn't know I had to pay to get food on a train. And, and when you live in an authoritarian society, one of the biggest uh, currencies is information. People are so desperate for information because they don't have it. So it was surprising to me, two things. One, they were desperate for dollars, and I had those. Uh, but the second thing is people wanted to know what was going on in the outside world. What's America really like? We hear that it's like this. What is it like to travel to other places? How does your system of government function? They're so desperate for information because they've been starved from it. And so in a society in which we have a free press, we have that liberty. We have that information. And so whether we like what it is that someone is saying or not, we should protect it because that's an important part of being free. So before I move on to any questions or comments you might have, because I'm certainly not you know, the living expert on everything free press, uh, I'll just leave you with this quote uh, from Benjamin Franklin, which by the way, I looked at like 15 different sources to make sure that this really was Benjamin Franklin's <laughs> quote. I'll tell you, I was at this conference two weeks ago, and it was actually being put on by Stony Brook, and it was about the, the media. And he put up a quote, um, it was a really good program, but he put up a quote and he attributed it to Winston Churchill. And I knew right away that the quote could not have possibly come from Winston Churchill because the quote was something like, a lie will make it all halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. Well, having lived in England, the word pants to the British means underwear, and there is no way that Winston Churchill said, before you have a chance to put your underwear on. So I said, I think that that might actually be um, um, uh, Samuel Clements, I think it might be Mark Twain, uh, uh, but we had to check it. So I checked this, um, and I think this is a good quote to leave us on. So, whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech. And so, that's what I will leave you. So, 